welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on primary and secondary active transport. Transport across the cell membrane could be active or passive. Active transport uses extra metabolic energy in the form of ATP, while passive does not. And that's because active transport is movement against an electrochemical gradient from low to high, versus in passive transport, the solute moves along its gradient from high to low. So it's like pushing a boulder up a hill versus down a hill. Uphill needs more energy, and that energy is in the form of ATP. This kind of transport needs to use proteins in the cell membrane, and these proteins are called carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are used in diffusion as well, for facilitated diffusion, but remember that diffusion is along the gradient, it's passive transport from high to low. Here we're talking about active transport and these carrier proteins can be called pumps in active transport. These proteins could participate in primary or in secondary active transport. Primary means it's going to use ATP directly. Secondary means it's indirect, and I'll get the secondary in a bit. First, let's understand primary active transport. There are three classic examples for primary active transport, the sodium-potassium ATPase, the calcium ATPase, and the proton-potassium ATPase. ATPase. These are enzymes. So these pumps are enzymes that hydrolyze ATP when it binds. ATP by the ATPase undergoes hydrolysis to form adenosine diphosphate, that's ADP, and an inorganic phosphate. That's a high energy phosphate bond, so energy is released. The phosphate gets transferred to the carrier protein, so it gets phosphorylated, and that's followed by a conformational change. To understand it, we'll take the first example, that's the sodium-potassium pump, which is the most common active transport pump seen in most cells of the body. This pump will move three sodium ions out of the cell and two potassium ions inside. Inside the cell, normally, potassium is higher. Outside, sodium is higher. So if this were diffusion, sodium would enter and potassium would leave. But here we're talking about active transport. It's against the gradient. So sodium leaves and potassium enters, three sodium and two potassium. So it's got a coupling ratio of three is to two. The sodium potassium pump has alpha and beta subunits. The beta subunit is a glycoprotein. It's the alpha subunit that moves the ions. And this is just a schematic version of it that I've drawn to explain it. It has binding sites for those ions and also for ATP. Now remember when it phosphorylates, the conformation changes from an E1 to an E2 position. In the E1 position, the binding sites face inside the cell, and they have a high affinity for sodium ions, so three sodium ions bind. ATP by the ATPase undergoes hydrolysis, the phosphate gets transferred to the carrier, phosphorylation changes the conformation, and now the binding sites face extracellularly. The E2 position where sodium ions get released, potassium binds because of the higher affinity. There's dephosphorylation, and the conformation changes again, so now potassium can enter the cell. And we're back at square one. By doing this, three sodium ions left the cell, and two potassium ions entered, making this an electrogenic pump, because it's creating a charge separation across the membrane, Three positive ions are leaving, two positive ions are entering. That's why the sodium-potassium pump is important for maintaining the resting membrane potential. It's actually important for a lot of things, like basal metabolism. The thyroid hormone, it can stimulate this pump. It also maintains cell volume, it's important for signal transduction, so it's a super important pump. Now that was the sodium-potassium ATPase. The second example was a calcium ATPase. Calcium is higher outside cells. The calcium pumps keep the cytoplasmic calcium low. The pumps, they push calcium outside the cell across the plasma membrane, and these are called the plasma membrane calcium ATPases. There are also pumps that push calcium into the endoplasmic reticulum, which in the case of muscle is the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It's the sarcoplasmic endoplasmic reticulum calcium ATPase, SARCA. So calcium gets stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's important for muscle relaxation. 
So by pushing calcium out of the cell or into the sarcoplasmic or endoplasmic reticulum, the cytoplasmic calcium stays low. The last example is the proton potassium pump, hydrogen ions and potassium ions. It's the same thing, they're going to move against the gradient. There are two important places where these pumps work, and that's the parietal cells of the stomach, which makes sense because those hydrogen ions are needed for gastric acid production. The second place is the renal tubules, the late DCT and the cortical collecting duct. That's important for the kidneys to regulate acid-base balance. All of this we talked about till now that was primary active transport, where ATP was used directly. Secondary active transport uses ATP indirectly. One solute moves downhill along its gradient from high to low, and a second or sometimes a third solute gets coupled with it, moving against its gradient from low to high. The downhill solute is usually sodium. Either they can move in the same direction, when it's called co-transport, or they can move in opposite directions, when it's called counter-transport. Co-transport, the best places to understand that are in the intestines and the kidney. To understand this, we're going to take the kidney as an example. This is a proximal convoluted tubule cell, and it's got a basolateral membrane towards the interstitium and a luminal membrane towards the lumen. The PCT is a major site of reabsorption in the kidney, Glucose and amino acids get reabsorbed here. That is by secondary active transport, so let's see how that works. On the basolateral membrane, there is a sodium-potassium pump, and we already saw that that is a primary active transporter. It pushes three sodium ions out and two potassium ions in. So sodium left the cell, and that creates a concentration gradient. There's now lower sodium inside the cell compared to the lumen. There's a transporter on the luminal membrane that'll bring sodium in along its gradient. The energy is used to bring another solute along with it, but against its gradient, like glucose. So glucose moved against its gradient, but it didn't directly use ATP, and that's why it's secondary active transport. But only if both sodium and glucose bind will a conformational change happen for both of them to get transported. And since they're moving in the same direction, this is a co-transporter or a symporter. The PCT also has a sodium-hydrogen exchanger. That works similarly, just that sodium enters the cell in exchange for hydrogen ions. So it's called an exchanger or an antiporter or a counter-transporter because hydrogen ions moved in the opposite direction to the sodium ions. The sodium-hydrogen exchanger is an example of secondary active transport, not to be confused with the proton-potassium ATPase. That was primary active transport. Similar to this is a sodium-calcium exchanger, which is in the kidneys and is also in cardiac muscle. So there are lots of different examples for co-transport and counter-transport. These were just two that I used to explain them. And both co-transport and counter-transport remember that they didn't use ATP directly. The primary active transport used ATP and created a concentration gradient. The energy from that brought another solute against its gradient from low to high. So these are secondary active transport. And that is primary and secondary active transport. If this video helped you, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.